And what they speak today about is uh, angioedema, and comes along with angioedema is high, such as urticaria. Um, but there are some advances that have been made, uh, especially with hereditary angioneuronic edema, and there has been some advances made with urticaria, and I just wanted to uh, discuss a little bit about that today. So here we go. All right. So if you take a look at um, hives and angioedema, you see that most patients will present uh, with urticaria alone, 50% of patients that have uh, allergic reactions to something will present with urticaria, but 40% will d develop urticaria and angioedema, and then 10% of the population will present with angioedema alone. Um, and I think most of the practitioners are a little more concerned when they see angioedema alone. I think it's a little more scary when patients only develop angioedema. They say, why is it that the patient's only developing angioedema? Why do they not have lives? And the truth is we're going to see that angioedema is a little bit different than urticaria, and it should be approached a little bit differently. Okay. So, first of all, what's the difference between urticaria and angioedema? Hives generally involves the more the superficial dermis, where angioedema is more in the deeper dermis. So when the patients have hives that's more superficial, they're mainly going to get itching, the redness, the swelling, uh, where if you have angioedema, instead of getting more itching, you get more pain. Sometimes the patients complain that it, it's burning. Now that you have both, then you can have uh, both of those symptoms. But the only difference really is that angioedema is really uh, in the deeper layers as opposed to hives, which is more superficial layers. Okay. And with urticaria, the patients mainly present with pruritus, elevated papillal plaque-like elevations of the skin. Um, and this is important because a lot of times we get patients that have, let's say, uh, what may be um, um, erythema multiform, where they get target lesions, and sometimes hives can look like target lesions. In general, not always, but in general, if someone's going to have hives, the lesions should last less than 24 hours. So if you have someone with lesions that are lasting more than 24 hours, let's say three, four, three or four days already, then you say, whoa, whoa, this may not be hives. And certainly if you want to diagnose erythema multiform, which sometimes could be with the target lesions, it could be hard to tell when someone is on a medication, you're trying to decide whether it's hives or not. I've had plenty of patients come in and the practitioner didn't know whether it was really um, erythema multiform or, and target lesions or it was regular hives. So the first question I ask the family is, how long have each of the individual lesions last? So if the individual lesions last less than 24 hours, there's no way it could be uh, target lesions. If they're lasting a few days, then I say, oh, maybe it's really not hives. Um, if it's more than 24 hours, then you have to worry about uh, other problems, uh, like you might have a vasculitic uh, type of lesion, you may have uh, contact dermatitis, uh, but it's less likely to be hives once it's lasting more than 24, uh, 24 hours. I have a question. Yeah. So say they develop some sort of skin lesion, and they do take an antihistamine, and it resolves, but if they then don't take their second dose of antihistamine, the lesions come back. So they respond to antihistamine, but persist for longer than 24 hours if they have a break in their treatment. How would you kind of use that rule of thumb to shake that one out? Okay. Uh, first of all, let me just add, anyone can ask any questions any time. I'd rather answer questions than talk about what I want to talk about so you can interrupt me like Jill already did. So just question is, is if you treat somebody and they respond, and then the lesions come back. So uh, when, we, when I mean that they, the lesions last 24 hours, that means they, that individual spot that they have is there, and that individual spot will disappear within 24 hours, and then it might come in different areas. In general, that's what happens. The patient will respond to the antihistamine, but then it will come out, but it typically comes out in a different spot. Uh, so, and, and, that's, and, and Jill brings up a very good point in that if the patient responds to an antihistamine, the author is high. All these other lesions are not going to respond to antihistamine. So if you have a vasculitic lesion, you, have, or you, you had um, uh, irritant multiform, it's not going to respond to an antihistamine. So that's a, another good way of telling you uh, whether you're dealing with highs or something else. But if you, if you respond to antihistamine and it comes back again, that's, that's you know, that's highs. 
and, and uh, typically does that, typically will come back. Okay, so I, I, spent, I, I spoke, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago, I always like to show the pathophysiology of allergic disease because it reminds us what to expect. And in order to make IgE, which is the antibody you need to bind to a mast cell to have a true IgE or type 1 allergic reaction, you need to make, you need to have exposure. So what tends to happen first is the allergen gets picked up by what's called an antigen presenting cell. The antigen the presenting cell processes the allergen and puts it on MHC2 molecule. Then it starts presenting it to naive T cells. And the naive T cells then stimulate other T cells to secrete interleukins. And when you secrete interleukins 4 and 13, it stimulates B cells to become plasma cells. And plasma cells make IgE, and IgE goes around the circulation. And once you have IgE around the circulation, it lands on a mast cell. And once you have IgE sitting on a mast cell, with three exposure, a person could have an allergic reaction. So the theory is, and it, it, the theory is true about 98% of the time, that if a patient hasn't been exposed to an allergen, they shouldn't react. Uh, but we've seen plenty of exceptions to the rule. We've seen patients who the mom's got a peanut allergy, and Johnny's been given the first time a little peanut butter, and they have a reaction. The mom's convinced it's the first time, and it could happen. It does happen that way. And we know the kid hasn't been exposed in uterine because the mom's got a peanut allergy herself. Uh, so the rule I'm telling you is a general rule that doesn't apply all the time. So, so here's, uh, like we just said, you had an antigen presenting cell, the presenting the allergen to now your T cell stimulates T alpha 2 cells to stimulate B cells. B cells become plasma cells to make IgE. The IgE goes around the circulation. But you see with all these interleukins going on, you're also stimulating mast cells and eosinophils, and you need more mast cells and you need eosinophils for the later reactions. When you're dealing with other types of reactions, you could sometimes stimulate the T alpha 1 pathway. So if you have a contact reaction to, let's say, nickel or poison ivy, you're stimulating the T alpha 1 cell to stimulate the T cells, and then you get a contact reaction uh, uh, that way. That would be, that's a non igb reaction. But when we're dealing with igb reactions, we're dealing with stimulating the T alpha 2 pathway. I'm sorry, that other thing that you said is very interesting. Is there any of these interleukins or IgE or any of that cross the placenta? Uh, so IgE shouldn't cross the placenta. Uh, I don't think anyone studied whether interleukins cross, cross the placenta. IgA and I, I mean IgG definitely crosses, but uh, I don't think IgE crosses. Um, I did want to say something, and I, okay, let me see if I, uh, all right, okay. Oh, we need the yeast in the full to cause the uh, um, inflammatory reaction, okay. And you see now, once you have your Ig sitting in the mast cell, the allergen comes along, binds two Ig molecules, causes the mast cell to degranulate, which releases histamine um, and other chemicals. And I'm going to show you the next slide, which causes your reaction. If it's in the nose, it's sneezing around your congestion. If it's in the skin, you're going to get vasodilatation um, and the uh, fluid comes up to the surface uh, and uh, the red cells come a little close to the surface and that's why you get the hives. If you, the other thing about hives is if you stretch the skin, you'll notice that you could make the apparent rash uh, disappear. But what's important, and then by the way, once you have your allergic reaction, then inflammatory cells come in like the eosinophil, which causes inflammation and if it's in the lungs, it causes the airways to become a little bit more responsive. But this is important in that it's not just histamine that's released. It's other chemicals like glucotriol plays the activating factors, and those chemicals cause exactly what histamine causes. Uh, vasodilatation, increased microvascular permeability, bronchial uh, constriction, um, and also uh, causes inflammatory reactions to happen. Why is that important? Because you'll see a lot of times Mom brings in Johnny, he has an uh, allergic reaction, he's got hives or angioedema, and then you, you give them antihistamines, they don't get better. Why is it not getting better? Because it's not just histamine, it's just histamine, uh, an antihistamine would work. But you know that there are other chemicals that play a role other than histamine. And then when you bring in the eosinophil, the eosinophil releases chemicals like platelet activating factor, leukotriene C4, which again causes what histamine causes. 
once you have this inflammatory reaction, uh, uh, it can be even more difficult to treat the hives just with an antihistamine. That's where the steroids would uh, come into play. Okay. Now, this slide that showing the arachidonic acid pathway, uh, you don't have to remember anything from this slide, but I just wanted to point out that there are allergic reactions that you have that uh, aren't caused by IgE, okay? And classically now, when I was a resident, and we were just starting to use Motrin, it was a prescription, we never really saw those reactions to Motrin. Uh, uh, because we just didn't use it. Now that everybody's buying it over the cap like water, we see many, many reactions. How is it that motion causes a reaction? It's not IgE mediated. It has nothing to do with IgE. What it has to do with is the arachidonic acid pathway. You have the normal cyclooxygenase pathway, and you have the 5 lipoxygenase pathway. If you go down the cyclooxygenase pathway, you make prostaglandins and thromboxane A2. If you go down the 5 lipoxygenase pathway, you make the leukotrienes. And as we showed before, leukotrienes play a role with what looks like angioedema and hives. So the, his, the mast cells will release leukotrienes, and you'll have your hives and angioedema from the leukotrienes, because leukotrienes do the same thing. If you block this pathway, right, the cyclooxygenase pathway, you can push the farther toxinase pathway. So if you take non-steroidals, non-steroidals, block the cyclooxygenase pathway, and we believe uh, prostaglandin E2 actually, when it's made, um, stops this pathway from going. So if you don't produce prostaglandin E2, you're going to end up having the 5 oxidase pathway stimulated, and you end up getting more leukotrienes. So the theory is with agonal motion ibuprofen or all the other non-steroids except Tylenol, when you take it, you're going to cause a, a reaction that's really mediated by the leukotrienes. The reason it's important for uh, all you know to know is that anything that is IgE-mediated, or almost anything that's IgE-mediated, the theory could be a test for. If it's not IgE-mediated, it's much more difficult. So like for non-steroids, we don't have a test for it because it's not IgE-mediated. It's through this pathway. Okay. So, the difference between acute hives and chronic hives and angioedema is actually um, somebody arbitrarily decided that six to eight weeks, that if someone has angioedema hives less than six to eight weeks, it's considered acute, and if it's more than six to eight weeks, it's considered chronic. The truth is, is that in my eyes, I would cut it out in two weeks. Why? Because you really want to, in your mind, say what's causing the reaction. If, if you haven't figured out, someone's having angioedema or hives, for two weeks already, you haven't figured it out, that means they're going to more fit into the categories down here, where if it's happening less than a week or so, you may still have a chance of saying, hey, it's maybe one of these things. Meaning, with acute hives and angioedema, most of the time it's from three things. It's a, a viral infection, food-induced, or medications. Where if it's chronic angioedema, chronic hives, then you're dealing with non-allergic causes. It really rarely is ever a food or a medicine, um, and it's either patients developing physical urticaries, which is like dermographism, you scratch, either patients, 2% of the population, you scratch their skin, they welt up, or they develop other forms of physical urticaries, um, um, like uh, pressure, hives and angioedema, uh, cholinergic urticaria, exercise-induced, heat-induced, all these different types of physical urticaries. Then you have patients that have urticaria vasculitis. Those patients tend to have uh, really a vasculitis. The difference, again, is that if it's a vasculitis, it's not going to go away within 24 hours. It may last a week or two. Uh, patients, uh, most patients, by the way, that have chronic urticaria, uh, the cause is either idiopathic, you can do every test in the book and you'll never figure it out, or it's autoimmune related. And there's actually a test that we do uh, but the problem is the insurance companies don't like to pay for it. They fight with you, so we'll fight back. But it's not really worth it to do uh, on your own because the test for autoimmune urticaria picks up 80% of the cases. Meaning if you had 100 patients that you knew for sure they had autoimmune urticaria, only 80% of those will be picked up by the test in the patients. 
So that's what we do when we have when we have patients that are frustrated and want the answer, we'll send the test to say, yes, yeah, here's proof they have autoimmune urticaria. But it really doesn't matter whether they have autoimmune urticaria or idiopathic urticaria because we're going to treat them the same way. So I'm not sure what the distinction really means because if you look at the physical urticaria, mm -hmm. it's really acute. They scratch them, <clears throat> it lasts 10 minutes, it goes away, right? Mm -hmm. And it may not come on unless they scratch them. Well, that's the same thing if you're allergic to, you know, a right. system. But those patients tend to have it go on all the time. They'll sit down and with a little pressure, they'll develop hives. So it tends to be... Well, because they're being exposed to what yeah. causes them. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's the same thing with the acute one. If you, get, if you keep giving someone an NSAID when they're... They have urticaria from it, it'll never go right. away. But most of the time, eventually someone figures that out and they can do something about it. Most of the time you can figure it out and say, you know what, I better stop taking the motion. Where if you have different grants or pressure induced hydrogen angioedema, uh, you really can't do much about it. Right. Okay. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So with, with cold urticaria, is there an issue in diving into cold water? Yeah. So I wasn't going to get into it, but uh, you're absolutely right that cold urticaria is one of those. The, rare exception that if they can, most of the time the patient only has urticaria most of the time, you're not going to push them to carry an epi tank. So if they have five, it usually doesn't progress to anything worse than that. But with full urticaria, probably I think the number is about 60%, 60 to 70% of those patients, if they jump in a cold pool, can have a chance of actually anaphylaxis. Those that's where it could progress. So patients who have cold urticaria, um, we, we give them epipens in case they make the mistake of jumping into a cold pool. Yeah. Uh, when you say food induced reactions, what is the longest thing that the hives from like a right. low exposure? So, in, in general, you really should be a day or two, maybe three days. If something's going on long and long, it's very unlikely a food's going to be lasting for, uh, you know, more than just a few days. Um, um, and in terms of medications, uh, in the pediatric population, ANSAIDs is, is our biggest problem uh, because patients don't even realize. Like I had a teenager playing football, and uh, he was reacting to probably he was reacting to different ANSAIDs, um, and it became a problem because he, he had nothing else to use. But every time he played football, he needed to use it. Anyway, we 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 managed with him, and the mom. It was a very complicated case, and the mom actually asked me at the end. What would you do, Doctor? It, it was a very complicated story. I said, you really want to know the truth? I said, I wouldn't let him play football. <laughs> she, she wasn't happy. Okay. All right. So when you're dealing with foods, if someone has angioedema and hives, you really want to go with the money that. Uh, a lot of times we'll get patients from the uh, uh, general practitioner who will have sent a million texts on them and it comes up that uh, John is allergic to uh, Brussels sprouts or broccoli. And then I said, Mom, when was the last time Johnny had Brussels sprouts? Oh, he hasn't had it. So when, you, when you're thinking about foods that you're worried about, you want to think about, you know, the main ones. So if you're dealing with older kids, it's peanuts, nuts, fish, and shellfish. When you're dealing with an infant, it's milk, eggs, wheat, soy. And you all know that contamination very commonly happens uh, in restaurants. So once a patient has a reaction in the restaurant, it, it becomes <clears throat> more complicated. And viral infections can last uh, for weeks at a time, as opposed to foods that happen for just a couple of days, maybe two, three days. Okay. All right. So this is uh, probably the most important slide that I can convey to all of you. The most important way to diagnose the cause of hives and angioedema is the history, okay? If you get a good history, uh, you should be able to figure out where to go with it. Uh, a lot of times, however, the, the patients will forget they took a pill, they were on an antibiotic or something like that. So if you ask them a few times, so they come in a couple of times already, you sh and you ask them, is it possible you did this, is it possible you did that, and all of a sudden they have their sister's Chinese food that she brought or something, um, it may take more than one visit to figure it out, but after two visits, you should be able to uh, figure it out. And if it's a food, uh, it really should be picked up on the first time that they come in or the second time they come in. Um, and you can find out that Johnny had a fever the week before, he was vomiting, he had diarrhea, 
and had a, what clearly seems like a viral infection, and they didn't give any medication, there were no other foods, uh, then you know. And uh, the numbers in the, in the, artic on the, the articles quote that 70, 80 percent of acute heart is from a viral infection, where 30 years ago we used to say, oh, it was always from a food or medicine. Actually, 70, 80 percent of the time it's really from a uh, viral infection. And this is, this is very important. Never send immunocast tests, which people are still calling RAS tests, which most of them are not RAS tests, indiscriminately, especially panels, uh, because patients are overdiagnosed. I can't tell you, I just had it one last week, came in with lists and lists of foods that they're allergic to. Um, if you just listen to the story, you say, okay, Johnny had whatever he had, and you want to send for a test for mushrooms and broccoli, whatever you want to do, that's fine. But when you hit panel, when you hit those panels, you get everybody in trouble. Then they come to us, the, my uh, nurse practitioner or PA or a doctor, whoever it is, sends these tests and look at this, Johnny's allergic now to peanuts and he's allergic to shellfish and he's allergic to all these things. Um, and then we have to try to figure out whether there's really a potential for analysis. So it's not good to hit panel, that's the worst thing. Then they come in also with, oh look, you know, we, it's very rare that high can is going to be from the family door. It could be, but it's very rare. But when you hit panel, then the parents come in to me and say, oh, look, Johnny's allergic to the dog. And because they hit panel and it, it, for highs and then comes up, the dog test is positive. <coughs> then I have to convince the family that they didn't have to get rid of jo the, um, uh, the dog, and then they get really upset. Can you test for humans? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> what do we do when we get new patients who come with a list of uh, multiple allergies that we're suspicious of? Uh, we you got to really know? listen to the story and say, does this story correlate with, with the test? That's our job, is to sit for hours with the patient, okay? <laughs> yeah. We, we so know, it's, it's always the peanuts and the nuts and it's the pets, and we go through it, you know, look. Johnny was eating the peanuts and the nuts before September 1st, and nothing was wrong with it. He had a test on September 1st, and he told us the peanuts. Then we have to convince the family. Even though the test says you're allergic, you're really not allergic, you're eating it fine. The problem we have is that they have a three-year-old who sent up peanuts and nuts, and then they send that test. And then I have to deal with that test, like, is Johnny allergic or isn't Johnny allergic? And I have to scratch my head and say, I don't know. Now we have to do a challenge, and then, you know, all the anxiety builds up. Okay, so when you're dealing with my... Can I ask you a question about that first? Yeah. So, um, well, using the example of like, well, using both examples, you're not, this is mostly the case of highs. Like, if you're talking about someone's like respiratory and stuff like that, you, you should be testing them for the dog. Oh, absolutely. If they have a dog, if they have a dog, you should be testing them. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't have a dog, I'm not sure if you necessarily have to test for the dog. Unless the neighbor has a dog, you know, they go at the neighbor's house, <coughs> right? Okay. <laughs> so me, but I'm, I guess I'm trying to get your meaning, which is that if you tested the person for allergies and it came up positive that they're allergic to dogs, then it doesn't matter because they don't have a dog. I don't. Te I, I will only test if it's clinically relevant. Okay. Okay. All right. So moving on. So in general, when you have highs in angioedema, we're going to start off with a, an antihistamine to treat them. Um, and this is very important because if patients have angioedema with their hives, angioedema tends not to respond well to antihistamines. Those are the patients that they, come, they usually come to me. They've been on a few days of antihistamines and it's not working. And I just say it's not, it's not going to work. They're going to need to be on a steroid. Uh, if a single antihistamine doesn't work, then you can either bump, bump up the dose, you can double the dose, triple the dose, whatever you want to do, or you can add a, a, a second antihistamine. And then with acute highs, certainly it's totally okay if they're not responding to put them on some oral steroids. Most patients will respond to, to oral steroids where they may not respond to an antihistamine. Um, and we have the older generation, diphenhydrin, which is Benadryl, hydroxyl, which is Atarax, and the newer medications, loratadine, fexabendine, cetirizine, and levocetirizine. Um, uh, the 
The older generation medications are fine, just they're going to cause some drowsiness and some side effects. The new generations last a little bit longer. Um, the truth is, is that um, you probably shouldn't be using lorazepine unless the patient says it works really well because when the original studies that they did, it barely passed the FDA standards for passing. I mean, placebo was like 30% of patients or 35% of patients got better. They, they were like at 48% of patients. So it barely passed, and usually the others are going to uh, work a little bit better. So tyrosine and leucotyrosine are the best, although this tyrosine, you get a little bit more drowsiness than you will with all the others. And uh, you all know that the sedating ones, uh, the older ones are sedating and can cause more side effects and get some anticholinergic effects. The new ones are going to last a little bit longer without the side effects. Okay, so if you're dealing with someone who's got chronic urticaria, angioedema, all these different groups decide the best approach. Uh, this is from the British Society of Allergy, but the American Academy of Allergy in this country has their own recommendations. And I think anyone you want to follow is fine, whether you want to start with a non-sedating and give a higher dose of the non-sedating, like you can start with uh, uh, cetirizine and give them 10 milligrams to start, you can give them 10 milligrams twice a day, or if you want, you can give 10 milligrams of cetirizine and then you can give them Benadryl or hydroxyzine at bedtime. You can even try antileukotrienes. I have my own personal pages that I really have seen it work well, but theoretically it should help. Um, but the patients that have chronic hives, we end up having to go to other things, the ones that fail everything, which is either cyclosporin um, or uh, prednisone. So we, in the pediatric population, we don't have too many patients that we do that with, but occasionally we put them on a low-dose uh, steroid every other day for a while until we can see if we can get it in the, in, under control. But what's new is that a melazomab, which is Zolaire, was approved for high, uh, for uh, asthma, uh, I'm not sure, maybe 12 or 14 years ago, somewhere around there. Um, and um, someone decided that maybe it worked for hives. Um, why should it work for hives? We'll talk about it. But for asthma, the theory was is that if it's an anti-IgE -E, anti antibody, it can grab a hold of the IgE, prevent the IgE to land on the mast cells, and prevent allergic asthma. It turns out that it works for asthma that's allergy-related, allergen-induced, or it works for asthma that's not allergen-induced. And they started realizing that maybe their theory, why it works, isn't the true theory. And the truth is, is that there are anti-inflammatory effects that's kind of complicated that we won't go into. Uh, but if someone asked me how it works, I would say we're not really sure how it works. But it turns out that it works for asthma and it, and it works for hives. It's approved for patients who are above uh, 12 years of age. Uh, we have to give the patients an injection. That's the unfortunate thing. They have to come in uh, uh, every four weeks. It's approved for 12 and above. It's a very, very expensive medication. Uh, so when we're dealing with angiodema and hives, we say, what are the risks and benefits of going on that as opposed to the alternatives? So the alternatives of stronger cyclosporin and prednisone, uh, those uh, cyclosporine and prednisone, the side effects there are worse than with amelazomib. So that's why uh, most allergists, when they have someone above 12, might consider giving the patients Zola. The other, the real main side effect that people worry about is that 0.2% uh, of the patients that receive it may eventually develop uh, uh, an anaphylactic reaction. So, when, when, would they, when would they get that reaction? Ah, so very good question. Do you know more than everyone else? No. Okay. It turns out, you ask a very good question. Uh, you would think when someone gets an injection within an hour or two, they're going to have a reaction. And the truth is that most patients do react within an hour or two, but there are patients that have reacted like three days later. Uh, so that's why when we give it, we make sure the patients wait for two hours in our office the first couple of times. Uh, although you say, well, why don't you make them wait for three days in your office? <laughs> but it's not practical, so we don't make them wait for it. But they have a reward of cases even like three days so later. they all have EpiPens at home? Uh, so most of the patients have EpiPens. Yeah, it's probably a good idea if you're going to use it. Well, you probably shouldn't use it. But 
Uh, if, you, if, someone, if someone does use it, it probably should give the patients EpiPens. Okay. So this was the theory why it worked. Here's your IgE molecule, right? This is the FAB region, this is the FC region, and this is the amelazumab. So the amelazumab would bind to the FC region over here, and that if it bound to the FC region, now this IgE molecule couldn't bind to the FC receptor on the mast cell. And it's, it's known that it actually does this. It, it prevents IgE from binding to the FC receptor. Um, but again, even patients that don't have allergen-induced asthma, it works. And high patients who have no, most high, most chronic high patients that we're giving it to do not have any IgE involved with the reaction, but it seems to work. Yes? Are the insurance company still insisting that you have a sky-high IgE before the approval? <laughs> For asthma, you just need to have 30. For urticaria, you don't have it. You don't need an IgE level for that. So if you give the diagnosis to urticaria and GT, you don't need a uh, you don't need a level. So amelazumab binds to IgE to low free IgE levels. Subsequently, IgE receptors, the FCF epsilon receptor on the cells, downregulate, and we believe if you downregulate the cells, you're going to end up having less and less uh, mast cells. Uh, the mechani mechanism by which these effects of melasma result in an improvement of CIU symptoms is unknown. So if you ask anybody how it works for hives, the real answer is that we have no clue how it works, but it works. Okay. Um, I give um, uh, um, the allergy section lecture for the American Academy of Pediatrics a review board review course. I have a board review course every May, one, in, uh, one at the North Shore, one at Morristown. Um, so uh, the way those lectures work is that we, may, we, give, we uh, give questions and then we elaborate on the questions. So I'm just going to give you one that's related to this topic. A 10-year-old presents with recurrent angioedema of the extremities and at times his throat. His past medical history is significant for surgery to rule appendicitis, but no clear diagnosis was made. The family history is significant for a father with a peanut allergy and a penicillin allergy. The most appropriate test to Form is a peanut rash test, a C4 level, a skin test for penicillin, an SPEN, serum protein electrophoresis, or a C1 level. Does anyone know the answer that they're sure they have the right answer? <laughs> Does anyone want to guess? P1. 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 E. A anyone, anyone go for A? Anyone go for B? Anyone go for C? Anyone choosing D? How about E? Okay. So it's all good because most people know a little bit, but not enough. So we're going <laughs> to educate everybody on this. Now we really want to move over to angioedema. Angioedema alone has the same causes highs, but other conditions have to be considered. Okay. Angioedema is characterized by sudden onset of swelling of the skin, subcutaneous tissue, or mucous membranes. And you can have it anywhere, arms, legs, bowel, trunk, genitalia. It can happen anywhere. Usually angioedema, as opposed to hives, can last, uh, you know, 24 to 48 to 72 hours. So it does last longer than hives. Uh, and But... Uh, when it comes to hereditary angioedema, which we're going to talk about a lot, it can actually last even longer. Okay, so you can have allergic angioedema that we were talking about it has to do with IgE and hypersensitivity to foods or medications, insects, things, right? Uh, but you could also have non-allergic uh, angioedema. And the truth is, is that when angioedema continues most of the time, when it's lasting a while, meaning a couple of weeks we usually don't find the cause. Um, angioedema occurs as a consequence of local increase in permeability of capillaries and post capillary venules causing local plasma extravasation in response to such medias as histamine. Um, but when it's allergic, it's histamine. When it's non-allergic, it's mainly <laughs> bradycotton, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that. Okay. Non-allergic angioedema can be further classified into hereditary, drug-induced, acquired, uh, occurs primarily as a result of increased bradycarn levels. And bradycarn doesn't respond to antihistamine. So it's very important to figure out what type of angioedema that you're dealing with. 
And bradykinin is part of the kind of family of peptides that are released into the body fluids and tissue as a result of enzymatic action of the calicrinin system, which I'm going to show you. And bradykinin is thought to be one of the most potent substances in the system because it initiates the release of several important endothelial derivative vasodilatory mediators, such as nitric oxide substance P and prostaglandin. So these are going to cause, the bradykinin is going to cause a lot in the way of vasodilatation. So you don't have to know any of this, but just to, to remind everybody, how is Brady kind of made? You first start out with uh, factor 11, and you go through, down this whole pathway through the calicrinin pathway, and you, make, you end up making Brady kind. What's also important is that um, the, you know, the factor 11 uh, uh, cascade breaks off to the complement pathway. This is the complement pathway. You start with C1, and you can activate it, and you get C4, C2, C3, C5, and then eventually uh, you can attack the area where there's inflammation when the, whole, when the whole pathway goes down. You don't really have to know that. But what you need to know is that they are connected, and you need this enzyme, C1 esterase, in order for this to happen. Okay? So C1 esterase causes all these different areas to uh, reactions to occur, and you end up making bradykinin. And what there is in the system is bisontinic C1 esterase that allows the enzymatic reaction to have to make bradykinin. You have an inhibitor. You have a C1 esterase inhibitor. If you're missing the inhibitor, then what happens is the pathway just keeps going, and you make too much bradykinin. So hereditary angioic edema is a condition where the patients are missing their C1 esterase inhibitor. They have C1 esterase, the inhibitor they're missing. And the C1 esterase will stimulate the pathway to make bradykinin. What you, the patients need is the C1 esterase inhibitor in order to block the pathway from happening. It turns out that that C1 esterase inhibitor is also part of the complement system. So if you're missing the inhibitor, the complement system is, is, is stimulated also, okay? And that's important when we talk about hereditary angioic edema. Because when we come to diagnosing hereditary angioic edema, we diagnose it with a complement pathway, although the physiology of the condition has nothing to do with complement. The physiology of the condition has to do with bradykinin. So there's two pathways C1 esterase is involved with. We make the diagnosis with a complement pathway, but that's not the physiology of the problem. The physiology of the problem is that we're making too much bradykinin. So when uh, we talk about, let me just go off and talk about uh, other causes of angioedema other than hereditary angioedema. We have medications, and again, nonsterols is, is a, a common one we see that where patients will just present with angioedema alone, okay? And then we have patients we don't really see in the pediatric uh, population that often, but occasionally you'll, you'll have a kid who's got a cardiac uh, problem and he's on an ACE inhibitor, but ACE inhibitors uh, are notorious to causing angioedema alone. Okay, ACE inhibitors and not steroids. How, how does an ACE inhibitor cause uh, angioedema? It's because the ACE inhibitor is involved not only with the angiotensin converting enzyme pathway, it's also involved with the kininogen and bradykinin pathway. So you need, um, you need angiotensin converting enzyme to break down bradykinin. If you have an ACE inhibitor, it's going to inhibit the angiotensin converting enzyme, and then what's going to happen is bradykinin is going to get broken down, and you increase bradykinin, and when you increase bradykinin, you're going to get the angioedema from the uh, ACE inhibitors. Okay. There are patients that have angioedema from vibrations. Okay. There are patients that have uh, angioedema from pressure. They can get highs also, but very commonly they'll just get angioedema. Uh, if, um, they'll get it around the belt line or uh, if someone's carrying a purse all day or around straps around their bra. Wherever there's pressure, they'll take off whatever they're wearing and all of a sudden, a couple hours later, they'll develop uh, angioedema at that spot. Okay. Now I want to move on to, this is like uh, uh, the key part of the talk, hereditary angioedema. Okay. Very crucial. Um, when you get a patient who has angioedema, that's when the lights should go off and say, oh, this is, this is different, or this could potentially be different. And that's when hereditary angioedema comes up. If a patient has hives, 
and angioedema, you don't have to worry about this condition. This condition does not have hives involved with it. They do get sometimes this little red rash with it, uh, but it's not hives. And the way you know it's hives is the patients are going to complain also that they're itching. Patients that, that are itching and have red lesions don't have this condition because they only get angioedema alone. Okay, so it's very crucial. That's when you should think about when it's angioedema alone. It usually presents between 3 and 20 years of age. Um, uh, very commonly, they'll develop abdominal angioedema. So in the old days, before they did co uh, contra um, uh, what's it all? Uh, CAT scans. scans with contrast, they would go to the OR, assuming the patient had an uh, appendicitis, they would take out the appendix to find that it happened like another month later and it really had nothing to do with appendicitis. Now with uh, CAT scans, uh, the patients don't get misdiagnosed as much. The C1 esterase inhibitor is deficient. So when that is deficient, you, you end up having too much bradycon produced. The C4 is almost always low. Always. It's always low. The C2 is actually low during an attack. C1 esterase levels are low, but there's a version where you have actually normal levels. So there's two major versions. There's actually a third version. And now there's actually treatment. Ten years ago, we had no treatment for this other than using uh, things like oral steroids daily, and if they had an acute attack, we would give them fresh frozen plasma. The patients don't respond to epinephrine nor antihistamines nor steroids. So there really was no real therapy. All of a sudden, maybe eight or ten years ago, they started coming out with therapy for this condition. But the answer to the question that I presented before is everyone usually picks, like they did here, that the C1 is low. It's not the C1 that's low, it's the C1 esterase inhibitor that's low. So that was the wrong answer. So the real answer is C4. So if you have a patient who you want to work up on your own, who comes with angioedema alone, it's definitely appropriate to send a C4 level. 99% of patients with this condition will have a low C4 level. So if you ever have someone with angioedema alone, it's appropriate to send a C4 level. And I'm going to show it on the next slide, but many times the patients, when they're just starting, they'll have just minor episodes of angioedema. You may just blow it off and say, oh, he had a little angioedema. But uh, once it happens more than once, then you have to start saying, oh, maybe this is a kid who's going to eventually show full signs of uh, uh, hereditary angioedema. Is it any practice recently, or just is it? It's not, it's very rare. When I was, was full-time at Columbia, uh, I was part of a couple of studies, so we were taking care of a lot of patients. Now up here, up here alone, I have two patients. I have two patients up here. Does it matter? Is it early, like two, three years old or three or four years old? Well, the ones I have now are what, 20 and 30. Yeah. Oh. And it's lifelong, so once they have it, they have the diagnosis for life. Okay. So just to remind you, the same it slide. The time, or it, okay. it could be that, oh, the, most patients develop when they're a kid, as you can see in the next slide. Most patients are diagnosed, or I shouldn't say diagnosed, are having symptoms since childhood. It may take a while to get diagnosed. But most patients present uh, when they're a child. They may not get diagnosed until later on. Uh, but uh, they could start out with symptoms like, once every 12 months, and all of a sudden, boom, they're having symptoms every four weeks. And it's variable. We've had patients who, it's, it's genetic for most patients, so we've had relatives that have the disease and they have some injury on the other hand once a year, and then the sibling has terrible reactions every three weeks. And so it's variable how they present. It's variable how they present. So just to show you again that the C1 esterase inhibitor is all over this pathway, and without that inhibitor, the C1 esterase is going to work overdrive and can reduce bradykinin. And the C1 esterase <laughs> is involved with the complement pathway, so you're going to end up using up your complement, and that's why the C4 levels are down. And during the acute attack, the C2 levels are down. Okay, so there's three versions. Two are common, the third one is very rare. The, the first version is where they actually have, they don't make enough C1 esterase. The second version is they make the C1 esterase, but it doesn't work. So 85% of the patients have the version where they just don't have enough C1 esterase. 15% have 
uh, a dysfunctional human esterase. And the third version is a, is a version that doesn't make any sense, where all the tests are normal. Um, and it tends to happen more with females, so they think it's estrogen dependent. Um, we're going to leave that alone. Okay. Uh, so what's the prevalence? Uh, people are saying, how often is this genus? It's probably about 1 in 50,000. Uh, there's no difference in male or female, but it's triggered by physical or emotional stress, um, infections, fluctuation, hormones, pregnancy, very commonly by procedures. So that's why when the patient's having a routine dental procedure, we'll tune them up before they have a procedure, or if they're having any surgery, we tune them up to make sure they're prepared for any, uh, any uh, procedures. So in some ways, it's very similar to what we're nervous about. In times of stress, where you need to have more, you don't have it. Exactly. Um, so as we said, the, the deficiency, 85% is there, 50% it's there, but they don't, it doesn't work. And then the third version is probably less than 1% of the time where all the tests that you do are normal in patients. Um, and in terms of symptoms, uh, they usually have, we, we put them into three categories, um, they, uh, but they can overlap. But a lot of times they'll just present with uh, angioedema, the face and hands, arms and legs, that's it. Uh, and then a lot of times we'll have patients that just present with abdominal pain, whether it be the intestines or the stomach or the bladder and kidneys, so they get abdominal pain, that's where they get misdiagnosis of appendicitis. And then the third <coughs> is it involves their upper airway. Um, if you take a look, patients do present with the same thing all the time, but unfortunately, 70% of the time, the patients will eventually have their upper airway involved. So that's why it becomes important because their airway can collapse and then you have a real, real terrible emergency. That's why these patients, even though they have a symptom once a year, they really should be prepared to not to treat it. Okay. All right, I think we can uh, skip this. We're going to skip this and uh, talk more about this. 40% of people with HA experience the first episode before the age of five, 75% before the age of 15, and like 85% before, before the age of 20. Okay. Patients typically experience minor swelling in childhood. They may go unnoticed or just, you know, pushed off, don't worry about it. But then as they get older, uh, they start to present with worse symptoms. And 5% of adults with HA are asymptomatic while carrying this C1 esterase mutation. So there are patients that have it, they have the deficiency, but they never have any symptoms. How common is just entering the that's not without her Someone comes in with a little swelling okay. and goes away. There's no number, but the odds are if someone has angioedema alone, they're not going to have this. But if you miss it, it can be pretty bad because, in theory, it could be life-threatening. So that's why I say it's appropriate. If anyone has the angioedema alone, maybe the first time you want to push it off, it's fine. But if someone has two episodes of angioedema alone, you really have to send it. You just send a C4 level. 99% of patients will have an abnormal C4 level. So you don't have to send them for C1 esterase level. Uh, um, and you can make a mistake. If you do, you can get yourself in trouble because if it's not put on ice, you're going to get an abnormal result. Plenty of times we get patients referred to have an abnormal c one esterase level, the C4 is normal, and all I do is I just tell our lab, send it on ice, and it comes back normal. So the only thing I have to remember is, is the C4 level. And if you're taking the boards again, this is the common question that they, that they ask, the screening test in the C4 level. Yeah. Okay. Moving on with symptoms. Um, they usually develop a swelling that progresses over 12 to 24 hours, but where with regular angioedema lasts two to three days, this can last five days. And, uh, and they don't respond to antihistamines, prednisone, and epinephrine. Uh, they're periodic episodes that can happen every week, every month, every year. Everybody's different. Um, and in the pediatric population, it's less frequent, but eventually, as they get older, they're having more frequent symptoms. And we, we talked about precipitating factors, and I want to give some time to speech. I just want to get, I'm going to go through, I want to just go through treat, treatment. In the old days, again, there was really, there was no medication that was approved for this, treated. 
Uh, but we used to use, as the patients got older, we used to use uh, Danazol or Stanazolol, which is an uh, angiogenic steroid, which actually prevented attack. However, you have plenty of uh, problems with that. You can look on the slide. You got plenty of problems with this, so we really didn't like to use it. But now, what's happened is, is that for some crazy reason, a lot of different groups decided they were going to find a treatment for this, and there's a lot of different therapies. There's therapies to replace human esterase, okay? So you have companies uh, that are making Synrise uh, or Rusin, which is actually recombinant uh, C1 uh, esterase. The Synrise product is actually pooled from thousands and thousands and thousands of patients. The truth is that there's really never been a report of anyone getting any HIV or any other hepatitis from it, but it's pooled so it scares people. This company just got approval for their recombinant ones, so now people feel better if they're going to use a recombinant one. There's still a fortune of money. Treatment with these medications are basically six, seven thousand dollars a month. Um, so it's very, very expensive. They also developed calicrenin inhibitors. So if you inhibit calicrenin, then you in inhibit the production of bradycon. They also developed this acadaban. That's actually at Columbia. This is the one we studied, where we gave patients shots of acadaban. It's, it actually uh, uh, it's an antagonist to bradycon. Um, and that also works. None of them work great, but if we have patients that uh, have a lot of symptoms, we'll actually put them on uh, uh, infusions of this c one esterase, and we get them prepared with injections that they could use if they have an acute attack. So the injections of Calvitor, which is the calicron inhibitor, and the injections of Icanabent, which is the bradycanin antagonist that patients can have with them, and someone who's capable can give them an injection if they have an attack to prevent the airway from collapse. And I'll stop here right on time with Jill. Jill. Okay. And if anyone, I'll take uh, questions until I get thrown off. <laughs> yeah. So hereditary, can it be, um, can it be brought on by um, a steroid, like a, like a NSAID, or no? Oh, a very good question. No, NSAIDs tend not to bring it on, but ACE inhibitors do. And sometimes birth control both do. Very good. Excellent. Yeah. The question, uh, you mentioned that Zyrtec 10 milligrams of BID mm -hmm. for larger day. Can you do that indefinitely? Are there any issues with that at all? Um, you can do it indefinitely. The FDA, you know, whenever the FDA puts something over the counter, they're basically mm -hmm. saying that it's hard to uh, kill yourself by taking it. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and, and, and all allergists do that. You can, you know, you can take a leg on, uh, on an adult. First, you take later three times a day. There are studies that people take 180 milligrams three times a day. Yeah. Actually, on the same wavelength with the Zyrtec 10 milligrams BID, can you do that with the Is there a time frame to when you can give Benadryl as well? Yeah. The, the only side effects you're going to get, especially in kids, is that they're going to become drowsy. So if, if, they, if they're not drowsy, you can give them all the Benadryl. And sometimes if they're really bad, you tell them, oh, this is what Johnny's so bad. Give him some banjo, he's going to go to sleep. It's fine. Is there any role for H2 blocker? Oh, excellent question. Any role in H2 blockers? There's no study that proves that H2 blockers work in hives. Uh, every emergency room, you know, part of their protocol, someone comes in with hives or anaphylaxis, they have it on their protocol. Theoretically, it should work with someone who has hypotension because H2. Um, Receptors are on the blood vessels, so theory to work, but it's never really been proven. We used to use it, you know, I started doing analysis in 1990, let's say, and we used to use it all the time, and then we realized it never works. So most allergists aren't spending much time, unless we put them on steroids, also we're saying, you know what, give them some Zantac also to prevent them from killing their stomach, but we don't really, most allergists don't use it unless we're running out of things to do and we want to stall them. So, so, <laughs> You said earlier tonight about one of those allergy panels. Yeah. Is there any ever an appropriate time? A panel is never appropriate to set a panel. It's always appropriate to say, this is what I think they're allergic to. They had a reaction to whatever, you know, milk. Let me send a test for milk. If you send a panel, they're going to just say, uh, they, they may not tell you, but they end up at the allergy's office and we'll go through every test. You know, I'll tell you, Johnny was eating broccoli before the test, and he had a rash. Okay. But broccoli back in his diet, or you know, whatever the food is, 
just taking on the food. Um, just yeah. um, when you do steroids, like for hives or something like that, how do you do, do, you do a taper? Do you do, how do you do? If it's acute hives, I might just give them five days. If it's chronic hives, I, I can have people on it for weeks if I need to until I get them over to something else. So we have, we have older patients. The younger kids, we really don't want to give them cyclosporin or prednisone. But we have older teenagers and we have adults that we have them on a couple of months of, let's say, prednisone, and then we start talking about putting them on to the amalazumab or to give them cyclosporin or whatever. But acute highs, five days should be good. And there are five days, days that like don't They come in after they've seen the team by the general practitioner, and the five days didn't do the trick, and then we have to give them longer. But in general, it's, it's appropriate to give them five days for the initial event. That would be appropriate. But same as not, you don't have to taper it, like same as? No, everybody should know this, that if you give prednisone, less than seven days, some people say 10 days, some people say 14 days, but certainly less than seven days, you don't have to taper. Why do people taper steroids? Because if you take it more than two weeks, you might shut up the adrenal glands. Less than seven days, you're not going to shut up the adrenal glands. So you can go from 40 milligrams a day for seven days and just stop it. You're fine if you I, want. I'm more so the opposite, like, can, you know, do you, is there any method just giving them one dose or do, you know, three doses or? If you're going to start, it's probably better to just do the five days because you're going to give it two or three days. It's going to come back a few days later and you're going to restart it again. Yeah. Um, contact dermatitis when you put the kids on the prednisone. I was always put to, um, to wean it down. If you're, dealing, if you're dealing with someone who's got a minor problem, five to seven days is plenty. If you're dealing with poison ivy, yeah. that's a different story. Because poison ivy collects sweets. There it's a different story. If they case of poison ivy, then you might give them like, seven days of 40 milligrams a day, and then go down because it's such a bad case. There it would be appropriate. And I think the people in the back are gonna shoot me, so maybe I better come <laughs> off. Thank you very much.